All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the Stroop Effect today. And the Stroop Effect is called the Stroop Effect because that was the name of the guy who researched it back in 1935. So we're talking about an experiment uh, that's over 80 years old. So it's really, really old. Originally published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, has almost 15,000 citations, which just means that it's one of the most cited and one of the most replicated studies in all of experimental psychology. Um, Beyond that, this is something that's used in a lot of different variations of psychology. You see it a lot in clinical psychology, uh, you see it a lot in cognitive psychology and things like that. So what I want to do in this video is basically show you what the Stroop Effect looks like so that if you were to take this task, you would know what it would look like. Uh, and then we're going to go through the results, so what you would typically expect in the results, and then I'm going to talk about the theory behind those results, why we see those things that we normally see when we are looking at these data and then I'm gonna give you a couple of other variations of the Stroop effect because it's not just colors and words which is what a lot of people think about it's actually a little it can be broken out into different kinds um, okay so to explain what you're gonna be doing in just a moment I'm gonna give you a couple of words uh, or actually several words and what I want you to do is I want you to name the color of the word okay so I don't want you to read I don't want you to read what the what the word says. I just want you to tell me what the color of that font is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this fixation cue. And this fixation cue is just something that we use in experimental psychology to basically orient where your attention is at the moment. So I want you to stare at this thing. And remember, in just a few moments, whenever I start this, uh, to say the color of the word, but not the actual word. All right, so I'll let you get started. So let's look a little bit at the results now. I'm gonna show you a, a graph here. Uh, so on the left, this leftmost bar right here, what you're seeing is, uh, is basically results for standard regular font things, so for black font basically. On the y-axis we have reaction time, so how fast does it take someone to name that color um, that they've been uh, primed to say. So the higher this bar is, the longer it takes for someone to respond, basically. Okay, so the more interesting kind of results that we're looking for is going to be these trials, the congruent trials. Congruent trials are whenever the word and the color match up. And you can see that this, these results are basically the same as if the font was presented in black. But the plot thickens whenever we look at incongruent trials, or in other words, whenever the word and the color do not actually match. So when the word and the color don't actually match, we see uh, this right here. We see um, that it takes much longer for someone to react to that, much longer for someone to be able to say what that color actually is. So the reason why this happens, and this is an explanation that cognitive psychology gives us, is that basically that reading is an automated process, that we can't stop ourselves from reading that because reading is so automatic to us that we can't disengage from that process. And so when we see words that are in our language, we can't help but kind of read out what it actually says. And so because we can't inhibit that information, it interferes with the other cue, which is the color of the word. Whenever those things conflict, whenever they interfere with one another, it causes a delay in reaction time. Because basically, you can kind of think of attention as kind of like this bottleneck, where we can only let in so much at a time um, before our brain kind of funnels it. Um, and so when we have these two kind of competing pieces of information, um, we don't have the ability to do it as quickly um, because of that, that, that bottleneck process. So this idea that reading is just an automatic process, this is something that's testable, right? And so based on that hypothesis, kids that don't have the ability to read yet shouldn't be able to have those effects, and that is indeed what they find. If you have kids that do this task and they can't read yet, they have no problem with this at all. It's just our ability as English reading people to you know, not be able to, to do that task. So this is a cognitive task. It's not a perceptual task. So the color is kind of only... That's only part of the problem. The real problem that we have is that we read uh, automatically. 
So I'm gonna give you another example of a different kind of stroop. This is called the counting stroop task. And the counting stroop task, instead of looking at colors, what you're gonna be looking at is a number of words. So for example, you may see the word four, four times. I want you to count, I want you to count how many times you see those words, how many words there are on the screen. So if you see two words, you're just gonna say two. Okay, easy enough, right? So just count how many words are on the screen, ignore what they say. All right, so you can probably tell which of these trials are going to be incongruent and which are going to be congruent, kind of like the last uh, procedure. So let's look a little bit at the results. Again, we have the same format where basically the lower the value is, the faster people are able to respond to it. Uh, the higher the value, the longer it takes for someone to respond. And what you see is that whenever there's a congruent trial, in other words, whenever how many words there are on the screen matches what those words say, so in this case, uh, two words that both say the word two, we see this baseline level of reaction, uh, or how long it takes for them to respond. However, whenever we are uh, using an incongruent trial, or in other words, having interfering pieces of information, we see that it takes them much longer to say how many words are on that screen. So in this case, you see the kind of example here is that we see the word three twice. So competing pieces of information. And again, this, the theory is the same. We're talking about the same kind of process that's going on with the color stroop, which is that we have these two competing, two competing kinds of strains of information that we can't really express quickly enough. And this happens because we can't really inhibit what we are reading. We can't do that. Um, and so it takes us longer to say that. Now, a kind of a variation of this is something that's gonna be used a lot in clinical psychology, which is called the emotional counting stroop. And so you're gonna do the exact same thing again. You're just gonna be counting how many words you see on the screen. This time the twist is that the words, instead of being uh, numerical in nature, instead of uh, being uh, uh, numbers that we see, we're gonna be having uh, three different kinds of words. We're going to be having uh, neutral words, so words that are baseline that don't really have any kind of uh, positive or negative association. We're going to have positive words, which are things like puppy or happy or things like that, things that give you a good feeling, and negative uh, words, which are words that oftentimes we'll have to deal with someone's traumatic experience if you're studying PTSD or if you're studying anxiety or things like that. So these emotionally charged, negatively valenced words. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples of this. And so what I want you to do is basically just to count how many words you see on the screen. Okay, so that's all there is to it. All you have to do is count the words on the screen. Now, before we go on, I want to tell you a little bit about why people use this and what you can kind of expect. That someone who doesn't have really, that someone that has low levels of anxiety, someone that uh, doesn't have PTSD or anything like that, is going to uh, be considered a, a normal control, uh, which just means that positive or negative words are not going to influence how long it takes for them to respond. This kind of task is used to really study kind of the cognitive processes of people that have post-traumatic stress disorder, people who have generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorders or uh, even major depression and things like that. So um, here I'm going to show you the results one more time that for neutral words, so these kind of neutral words, these baseline control words that don't really have any positive or negative kinds of connotations or associations, we see this base, this is considered our base rate. We're going to compare everything to this. Now, let's look at the positive words. Positive words, not that different, right? So positive words don't really have that much of an impact, but the negative words have a tremendous impact on how long it takes for someone to respond. And you might expect that uh, for people that have PTSD, for example, uh, that negative uh, these negative words are really going to vary based on your personal history. So someone that maybe developed post-traumatic stress disorder while they were uh, experiencing combat in the military are going to be experiencing this for words like gunshot or words like um, bomb or words like 
blast or something like that, where someone who may have developed uh, PTSD through something like sexual assault may have, you know, be an entirely different set of words, such as like cologne or or perfume or uh, or alcohol or uh, bar or something like that that might be more relevant for their personal experience. So we see some kind of uh, some individuation. Uh, for those different kinds of things. And again, the reason why we do this type of thing is to look at the cognitive processes that are going on for people of, of all walks of life. Um, we can look at kind of regular functioning uh, by looking at the color stroop or the counting stroop, and we can look at more individual kinds of populations um, by looking at the emotional counting stroop task. And if you haven't gotten a chance to do it, go ahead and dig up that 1935 article and give it a read. Um, it's one of the, like I said, it's one of the most important studies in experimental psychology. And that's the Stroop, uh, that's the Stroop task in a nutshell. So, thanks. Bye.